Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 343rd episode, we have a bunch of news, including some ankylosaur news Ooh. that I dug up. It's not new news, but it's news for us. <laughs> yes, it is. It's really cool. I should have covered it when it first came out, but it's gotten some more attention recently. So I think it's worth covering now. And I guess Sabrina has some other news, too. I a think lot I said, of news. There's a sore pod in the mix. I think I noticed. <laughs> oh, did you know? That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. We also have Dinosaur of the Day, Juchung Tyrannus, and a fun fact about dinosaur fossils, which were destroyed in museums, mostly during World War II. But on a happier note, we want to thank our patrons for supporting us and keeping our podcast going. And this week, we have a new patron to thank, and that's Ashley the Acrocanthosaurus. So thank you very much for joining and keeping the podcast lights on. Nice alliteration, too. Yeah, that's a good one. And rounding out our shout outs, we've got Trev, Jonah, Ellen, the Tolbert family, Kyle, Kelly, Jared Copeland, Morgan Eklove, and Myco Raptor. Yeah, thank you so much to everybody. We really appreciate all of your support. It's because of this community, our dinosaur enthusiasts, that we can keep this show going every week. So thank you. And if you want to join our growing community and get different perks like bonus content and access to our Discord where you can chat with people about dinosaurs all day, every day, <laughs> <laughs> go to our page at patreon.com slash I know dino. So jumping into the news as promised, I got my ankylosaur story. Garrett's grinning ear to ear. I'm pretty happy about it. This one was written by Jin Young Park and others and published in Cretaceous Research. In it, they described three new Talarurus skulls, which always feels like I'm speaking with a mouthful of marbles when I say Talarurus. <laughs> <laughs> the paper was available online for about a year, but like I said, it's getting some more attention now. I'm not really sure why, but people are talking about it a little bit. As a recap from your Dinosaur of the Day in episode 235, when you did Talarurus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Talarurus is an ankylosaurid from the Bayan Shuri formation in southern Mongolia. And that makes it pretty early for an ankylosaurid. It's all the way back about 84 to 100 million years ago, which is pretty old for a true ankylosaurid, the ones with tail clubs. It was named by Evgeny Malayev in 1952. And the name refers to its wicker tail basically what it translates to talarurus hmm. <laughs> the reason they call it a wicker tail is because it has bony struts in the club that interlace together sort of like wicker so yes it is an ankylosaurid with an actual club that has been discovered which is nice that is yeah it's but it wasn't too big it was estimated to be between four to six meters or about 13 to 20 feet long and it weighed about two tons which for an ankylosaur is not really all that big and back when you were talking about it in your Dinosaur of the Day, you mentioned that there are about seven individuals that have been described, but there were at least a dozen specimens in total that were known. So this is sort of filling in three of those at least nice. that are now officially described, not just known out there in the world. It's been a while since we did that Dinosaur of the Day. Yeah, it's like a hundred plus episodes ago, mm -hmm. so over two years, basically. You also mentioned that the skeletal mount at the Moscow Paleontological Institute used a Pinacosaurus or Pinacosaurus skull. And that's because the original skull material was very incomplete. So they, just like with Brontosaurus and some of these other dinosaurs where we don't find skulls, stick a similar relative skull on it and call it good enough. But fortunately, a second partial skull was described in 1987, which was a little bit better, but still left a lot of gaps in our knowledge about Talarurus and its skull. Since it was a partial skull. Yeah, they're both partial skulls. And it's really important to get a good skull because ankylosaur genera are mostly distinguished by their skulls and the pattern of those armor plates on the skull. So even though it was named for its tail, it's all about the skull. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure exactly when it switched over. I feel like Victoria Arbor is sort of one of the driving forces in differentiating based on the skull because that's mostly what we have with ankylosaurs. And they tend to be pretty consistent within a species some of these details so they're just a good thing to compare and we often find them for ankylosaurs too so in order to be sure that you're not just creating new dinosaur names for dinosaurs that are actually already named the best thing to do is to have one consistent bone that you're constantly basing your names on and with ankylosaurs we have the skulls and i think it's actually one of the best described thanks in large part to victoria arbor 
where we have that consistent basis for all the dinosaurs. Whereas with sauropods, for example, sometimes they're named based on a femur alone, sometimes they're named based on vertebrae alone, and whether or not those vertebrae and femur came from the same animal is anybody's guess. And then a lot of times they end up being nomum dubium later. But not so with Talarurus, because now we have three new skulls to work with. <laughs> <laughs> like the holotype, the skulls were found in the Gobi Desert in the Bayan Shuri formation, although it was spelled completely different. In the original one, it's two words and there's an EH at the end. And in the new paper, it's one word and it's EE at the end. So I don't know what that's about, but that's how they're spelling it. I guess it's just a different romanization. Yeah, could be. All three of the skulls were collected during the Korea-Mongolian International Dinosaur Expedition in 2007, which I think we've talked about before. I think they've discovered some other good dinosaur finds. A fruitful expedition. It was, yes. <laughs> you have to do a full expedition when you go into the Gobi Desert. You can't just do it lightly once in a while, pop out there, do a little bit, come back out. you got to bring a whole team with you, it seems like. Mm -hmm. But there's always good things to find. That's true. And they're not super hard to get out compared to some places in the world because they're in sandstone, which makes it a little bit easier. But then we were talking about in a recent interview how sometimes that can be a problem if it's too easy to get out because the matrix doesn't hold it together. Mm -hmm. But I guess at least it's helpful when you're in the field. So these skulls were prepared, they said, in South Korea in 2013, which to me means they got all three of them done in one year. Oh, yeah. Might indicate that they weren't too hard to prepare, hopefully. Now they're all kept at the Institute of Paleontology and Geology in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, which is nice that they made it back to their origin country. Mm -hmm. One of the skulls is in particularly good shape. It's basically missing the top back horns and the premaxilla. So another way to think about it is it's basically the top two thirds of the skull with a little bit missing. But it also includes a fragment of the right dentary. And it's the only lower jawbone known from any Talarurus. But unfortunately, there aren't any teeth or even tooth sockets in it. So it's a pretty partial fragment. Something's better than nothing. That's true. Another one of the skulls has the maxilla and a better underside. So basically, it's got the roof of the mouth and a lot of the details down below. So I think of it as basically a good bottom two thirds of the skull. <laughs> uh, that's good. You get the top two thirds and the bottom two thirds. Yeah. So there's a lot of overlap between the two, like a lot of the nasal, like the top of the head. But one of them is missing some of the stuff around the eyes and the other one's missing more of the front and bottom of the mouth. And then the last one is just in the worst shape. It's more or less the top one third on one side and the top two thirds on the other side, sort of sliced diagonally and missing lots of bits and pieces. But there's a lot of overlap between the two. So it's useful just as like an extra data point for some of these features. Sounds like between the three of most of the skull. Yeah, I think it's pretty much the entire skull when you combine the three. You certainly have all the major features, all the horns, all the maxilla, and a lot of it's in more than one of the individuals, too. And we have a really good premaxilla on one of them, too, which is nice. The beak in the front. The largest of them is about 30 centimeters or one foot long by about 37 centimeters or one foot three inches wide. And even though I said that's the largest one, they're all roughly the same proportions, but they have different pieces missing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they're, they have different proportions just because it's like, oh, that one's missing a chunk of the right side. So it's not as wide kind of thing. And one of them's missing the premaxilla, so it's not as long. So yeah, it is wider than it is long, which is kind of interesting. It's pretty like short and stubby face, you could say. All four of the Talarura skulls have a similar pattern of those armor plates on the top of the head. For example, it looks like there are always 20 flat or concave plates armoring the nasal region. So it's very consistent. That's why it's such a useful feature to look at when you're naming ankylosaurids. And the fact that these are also similar is a great sign for them being the same genus. Talarurus basically has three prominent bumps on each side of its skull. On the top back, the squamosal horn is pretty big, sticking out up into the back. Then on the bottom back, there's the quadratojugal horn, which is basically a mirror image from the top down to the bottom, more or less. I mean, it's not exactly a mirror image, but it gives you that same sort of it's got a bulge coming up out of the top back and the bottom back. So sort of like both spots can protect it from coming up from behind or down from behind. And then it also has a horn right above its eye, 
just in front of the squamosal horn. So it sort of looks like it's got a double horn hmm. on the top back. It's a mix of the armor plates and then these bumps on the skull that makes it unique. Yeah, they mostly based it on the armor plates. That's usually what they do. But technically speaking, some of these bumps I'm talking about are horns and some of them are armor plates that are just like extra grown. You know, they're like a type of osteoderm, basically. Mm. But the squamosal horns are literally horns more so than they are osteoderms. But in the case of Talarurus, they all stick out about equally. So they have a pretty similar appearance and it looks really symmetric and it's nice looking. Because of the symmetry? Yeah. Interestingly, the only unique feature that Arbor and Curry diagnosed in a 2016 overview paper was found to be individual variation in this paper. Hmm. So it's fortunate. They found more skulls. Yeah. And I mean, maybe they knew about these other skulls and were already knew that it was probably going to stay a valid genus and they were looking for anything they could use. I'm not sure. But I know that a lot of times in the paleontology community, just because it's not published doesn't mean everybody doesn't know it's out there right? and likely to keep something a valid species and genus. Phylogenetically speaking, its closest relatives are Zara Pelta, Cycania, and Tarkia, which are all from Mongolia, but those are all also about 10 million years or more more recent. That's a pretty big gap. Yeah. Well, in general, Talarurus was quite a bit earlier than other ankylosaurids. Those aren't even that late because those are in like the 75 to 70 million year time period. Whereas, you know, ankylosaurus is like 66 million years ago, which is even more recent. But the ankylosaurids from Asia are typically a little bit younger than the ankylosaurids from North America, which we think might mean that ankylosaurids evolved in Asia and then made their way over to North America later. Pinacosaurus is a much more distant relative than some previous analyses would have you believe, although Pinacosaurus is a little bit closer in time to Talarurus than those other three that I just mentioned, which are actually its closest relatives. So it's another example of how just being close together in time and even in location doesn't say much about how closely related they actually are. Yeah, they could be very different depending on how they evolved, even though they were living around the same time. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's basically like how us and lemurs are on a branch of mammals family tree <laughs> and we coexist, but we're not really, even though, you know, there are lots of humans living in Madagascar with lemurs, doesn't mean that they're close relatives. Don't have exactly the same lifestyle. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah. The only contemporary ankylosaurid that's in the family tree, at least in their family tree, there might be another one out there that they didn't include, is Sagan Tegia. But that one, again, is quite a few branches away on the family tree. I think it's even farther distant relative than Panacosaurus. So it didn't coexist with any close relatives that we know of yet. And that's another good piece of evidence that it probably is a valid genus, because if it's in a sister taxa with something else, then sometimes people will argue, oh, they should be synonymized or be in the same genus with different species or something like that. Talarurus and Sagan Tegia were about the same size. They both had skulls that were about 30 centimeters or one foot long, and their overall body length was about four meters or 12 feet in length, and they both weighed up to three and a half tons. So I guess this estimate compared to your dinosaur of the day has it on the shorter length and but a higher weight <laughs> range of things. One thing that's very heavy for its size. Yeah. I mean, they were, they were a bulky individual. I mean, with the width of its skull, you know, maybe it was wide all over and that would make for a heavy animal. The most notable difference is that Talarurus has a flatter beak that extends farther down towards the ground, while Sagantagia has a more forward-facing and a little bit more rounded beak. They used a really interesting rhino comparison to hypothesize about these beaks and whether it meant they were in different niches, if there was niche partitioning between the two different ankylosaurids. Basically, they talked about the white rhino, which has a broad rectangular muscle and grazes on low-lying vegetation, and the black rhino that has a more rounded muzzle that protrudes a little bit more and browses on high-growing shrubs. So in this analogy... 
Talarurus is the white rhino, grazing on low-lying plants with its broad rectangular beak, which is better for snipping at ground level, whereas Sagontagia is the black rhino, browsing on higher shrubs with a more rounded beak. When I think of broad rectangular beaks, I think of vacuums for some reason. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are a few sauropods like that, mm-hmm. like Nigerosaurus, which have that broad but flat <laughs> mouth. And it, yeah, like you said, a vacuum or a lawnmower, sometimes they describe it as because they could get close to the ground and snip off plants. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they have a little piece of paleo art too that, sh- that shows them side by side with Talarurus eating closer to the ground and Sagantagia eating basically shrubs a little bit higher up. Apparently, too, this same niche partitioning works for ungulates and ground sloths. They've seen the sort of rounded beak for high browsers and flattened, broader beaks for the grazers on the ground. Interesting. Yeah. With sloths. Hmm. Yeah, I had never heard that about ground sloths before. I guess that would be like a horse is probably the one that's browsing on higher shrubs and a cow would be maybe a flatter front <laughs> that's doing the grazing on low plants. Yeah, I suppose. At least, I mean, the horses that I've ridden always wanted to stop to browse on shrubs on the side of the trail. Mm. So I assume that's their normal modus operandi. And cows are famous for their eating grass, so. Mm-hmm. It's true. So maybe that means that Talarurus is another one of the cows of the Cretaceous. <laughs> It's eating like a cow (laughs) down on the ground. Maybe. It's a pretty armored and well-defended cow, though. So it can just sit in one place and graze all day. Yep. We'll probably move around a little bit to get new food. True. All right, enough about ankylosaurs. Let's get into the sauropod news. I guess. (laughs) You're right, there was sauropod news. There's always sauropod news, it seems. Yeah. Lately, it's great. So in Spain, in Camarillas, Teruel province, paleontologists found fossils of a new dinosaur, a sauropod. It includes part of a spine. They think it could be up to 25 meters or 82 feet long. They've got at least 15 articulated neck and back vertebrae. And those vertebrae are more than 30 centimeters or nearly 12 inches long. That's pretty big, but it's no Australotitan. I suppose as far as those European island dinosaurs go, it's pretty big. Yeah, I think they're saying it might be one of the biggest dinosaurs in Europe. They had to break up the fossil into two sections. Oh, no. (laughs) They used a rotating machine and a gondola to excavate the fossils. Oh, so maybe like a fossil block, but not the actual fossil itself? I think so. They still need to prepare the fossils and study it, but they think it's probably a new species. And at this particular site, a lot of fossils have been found, more than 80, and most of them are sauropods. Cool. The next one, it's not that new of a story, but the work is still ongoing, so it counts. Plus, Garrett, you just did an old news story yourself, so (laughs) here we go. (laughs) It's about Pops the Ceratopsian, and I partly wanted to talk about it because I like the name Pops. For a dinosaur, it's the most complete ceratopsian skull found in Colorado so far. And Pops was found in 1982 by Kenneth Carpenter and Emmett Evanoff. That sounds really specific, that it's the most complete skull in Colorado found so far. But it's actually, there are quite a few triceratops and other ceratopsian skulls that are found in Colorado. So that's still pretty good achievement. It's always good to have complete skulls, I think. Yeah. So this skull is about 4 feet or 1.2 meters long, which is small, but they think it belongs to an adult based on the texture of the bone. And it was found to be about 2 million years older than known Triceratops specimens. Mm -hmm. It was found on Seven Cross Ranch, which was owned by Sonny Mapelli. And Sonny donated the skull to the local government, Weld County. He wanted it to stay there so that local families could learn about it. Nice. And they had a contest. And that's how the skull became known as Pops. <laughs> so Pops was put on display at a county building, but was never fully restored. And that display eventually got out of date. It got a little bit discolored. So this was maybe in the 80s because you said it was found in 1982? Yes. I don't know how long it took to go on display, though. Gotcha. Joe Sertich, the curator of dinosaurs at Denver Museum of Nature and Science, 
said that scientists knew about POPs, but no one was really able to study POPs because it was in this, quote, gray area between museums and hiding up in a public facility. And that's according to a quote in KUNC. I'm guessing that means that it may not have been publicly owned in a repository. Maybe it was still owned privately, but on display publicly. And so researchers didn't want to publish on it. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. I think there might have been, based on this article I read, some tension, too, between the paleontologists who found Pops and the owner. Interesting. But I don't know too many details. The important thing is Pops went on display. Joe reached out to the Weld County officials, and he and his team are now allowed to study Pops in Denver, and in exchange, they're going to return Pops cleaned and restored to Weld County. So last fall, they took measurements. They found more boxes with Pops bones, more of the skull and other body parts, including vertebrae and parts of the tailbone. Nice. And they think Pops could be a new species. It's currently being prepared. Visitors can watch it being prepared in the fossil lab at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Oh, that's great. Yeah, those Ceratopsian skulls are always really cool to see because they're so massive. Mm Mm-hmm. And if this one's that complete, too. Yeah, four feet long and that complete. It must be really cool looking. It's nice that they have some of the body, too, because a lot of times all you get is a skull. Mm -hmm. Good old pops. All right, we've got some museum news and some probably more serious than usual dinosaur news. Oh. So I'll start with the Museum for Natterkuhn Berlin and 24 other museums and universities in Germany are creating a publicly accessible data repository of collections related to the colonial era. That doesn't seem that serious. That seems like a good thing. Well, when I say serious, I don't mean bad. Okay. Weighty, I guess. Like important? Yeah. I guess all dinosaur news is important. I think so. (laughs) (laughs) But sometimes we talk about people in inflatable dinosaur costumes. And then sometimes we talk about what museums are doing. and It feels a little bit different. It's true. So this is part of a larger project. The goal is to have transparency around holdings from colonial contexts. And this seems really timely with our interview from episode 340 with Nuseba and Emma. So they have three paths for this project. The first one is to create a central place to access collections already published. So that's basically the first part. Then they're going to digitally record and publish unpublished collections in a central data repository with commonly accepted standards. And then the last part is to digitally record and publish collections based on, quote, standards developed with the state and societies of origin, as well as the diaspora in Germany, end quote. And that's according to the museum's post. The museum director, General Professor Johannes Vogel, said, quote, It's a question of culture. Even a natural history museum has to be self-reflexive. Sooner or later, organizations like ours will have to deal with the dominance of Europe in order to understand the discussions. It's about the perspective of the many, not just that of the powerful, end quote. So in the initial phase, people will be able to access this repository through the German Digital Library. There's also a number of research projects happening, including one that culminated in a book called Dinosaur Fragments, and that's on the history of fossils collected from Tendaguru, and it goes through the history of the objects from 1906 to 2018, and that includes the skeleton of Brachiosaurus. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder, so the three phases, one of them is creating a central place to access collections already published. That sounds to me a little bit like, well, we already have these fossils, and they're already collected and published, so we're just going to keep them all here because that way they're in one place and not repatriate them. I hope I'm reading that wrong, but that's what that sounds like to me. (laughs) It's one of those things, it's a really complex topic, and they've got, what, 25 museums and universities in Germany that are working on this. Yeah. I'm sure it's pretty epic. Yeah, it would be nice if, I mean, I guess that third point talks about working with other museums. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that extends outside of Germany and includes like, some repatriating of fossils. Well, it says the state and societies of origin as well as the diaspora in Germany. So it's yeah. Both. Yeah. But they were talking about digitally recording and publishing in that one. So 
hopefully the the real fossils end up closer to where they're from. It's hard to say since it's still so early. Right. They are mostly talking about digital. Maybe digital is just the first part of it. Yeah. It's always a good place to start because if you're going to start moving fossils around, it's good to have a good copy Mm -hmm. or a cybertype. You just like to bring that word up every now and again. I did, I really like the concept of cyber types <laughs> that because with things like Spinosaurus, where the fossils get lost forever, if you had a, a really good scan of it and you're like, this is the bone, this is what the the name is based on, we wouldn't need a, a new holotype because you just always use everything for the the cyber type and it'd be easier to compare new finds. I just, I like it so much. You know, you, you say that every time you bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least I'm consistent. So next in the news, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, SVP, recently sent a letter to the paleontological community on Myanmar Amber. And it's based on SVP's ad hoc Myanmar working group's recommendations, which we did talk about with Nuseba again in our interview in episode 340. So SVP sent the letter to over 60 organizations, and it's to promote awareness of what's going on in Myanmar and its wider impact, including scientific research. And they made three main points. They said, one, the situation in Myanmar has gotten worse since the military coup on February 1st of this year. And that two, due to the coup, SVP is suggesting a hard moratorium on the publication of all fossils in amber that came from Myanmar after January of this year, 2021. And three, SVP is reviewing the previous moratorium it put on publishing about amber specimens acquired after June 2017, and the working group is developing best practice guidelines. So they're hoping that the entire paleontological community will work together. And with their post about this, they also provide additional resources on Myanmar amber mining, human rights violations, and amber trade. Yeah, yeah, that's an intense topic. Mm -hmm. I can see why you said this is the weighty, serious part. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit surprised since they already had that moratorium starting in June 2017 that they made another moratorium January 2021. It's almost like this time we really mean it, guys, because there was more publishing that happened after that. So, yeah, hopefully people don't publish on this. I didn't realize that it had gotten even worse this year. That's terrible Mm because it was already really bad. I mean, it's, it's a conflict that's been going on for many decades, so... Hopefully the end is near. Yeah. And I mean, like they were saying, they're hoping the entire paleontological community will work together because it takes a lot of people to make Mm -hmm. a difference here. Yep. Okay. The last item that is more on the weighty side, I would say. (laughs) In Italy, Italy's customs authorities shared a video recently where they found a fossilized sauropod egg, possibly Shunosaurus. The original post said that it was Shunosaurus. I'm not sure how they knew because yeah. it's hard to tell <laughs> Yeah, unless you have an embryo. Fossilized eggs aren't named based on dinosaur genera. They're named on ichnogenus, so yeah. should have a something ulithus in the name probably. It was found at the Milan Bergamo airport. It was illegally shipped from Malaysia and it had a certificate of origin with dubious authenticity issued by an organization that was later found to be non-existent. Oh, and, snap. Well, and the intended recipient didn't want to take ownership of it. So now it's been given to the state, quote unquote, for future display. So they're going to keep it in Italy, even though it was illegally exported from Malaysia? That's what it sounds like, at least for the time being. Maybe things will change. But it, yeah, it's interesting that somebody just... Made up a organization, filled out some fake paperwork. Well, I was thinking, just put that egg through an x-ray machine at an airport. (laughs) I mean, they might x-ray scan everything. Yeah, that's true. Some of those customs authorities got to touch a dinosaur egg. That's true. That's pretty cool. You've touched a dinosaur egg. So have I. Yeah. A couple of them. Okay, but still cool. (laughs) It is cool, yeah. All right, moving on to equally important, but I would say less weighty news. Happier news. Happier news. In Washington, D.C., in the U.S., the Southeast Library is hosting a dinosaur roaring contest. It's just like that prank. It was inspired by that prank. Okay. <laughs> so the announcement, according to D.C., says, quote, Do you have a killer pterodactyl shriek, a mean tyrannosaurus growl, or a wicked brontosaurus grunt? So you know, obviously it's not just dinosaur roars, but you get the idea. They specifically said it's not just for kids. They have a category for people 15 and up. <laughs> 
how many different winners are there going to be? <laughs> I'm not sure. But they tell you specific animal roars they accept. There's pterodactyl, stegosaurus, brontosaurus, T-Rex, brachiosaurus, velociraptor, triceratops. And then they have an other category. So I guess you can do whatever. It's pretty weird to have a contest on mimicking animals and to exclusively pick animals where we don't know what they sounded like. <laughs> yeah. It gives you more creative license, I suppose. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. This is weird. So the way you do it is you submit a video of yourself, no more than 10 seconds of yourself roaring. You have until June 30th, end of this month. They'll be announcing the winners July 15th. From what I could tell, it doesn't seem like you have to be a library patron to enter. Interesting. I'm not sure what you win. Maybe bragging rights? A piece of paper that said, I had the best animal roar in yeah. the ages 15 and up <laughs> bracket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is really weird. I like a good dinosaur contest, but like maybe they could do like a Parasaurolophus one because we could mimic the right pitch mm -hmm. frequency. But outside of that, like we don't really know a lot of dinosaur sounds. It's pretty hard to mimic the kind of sounds we think T-Rex made, like that emu bellow sort of thing. Right. Or like a crocodile growl, which is way below the frequencies that humans do, can make. You could do some guttural sounds or maybe chicken sounds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just cluck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's true. All kinds of options. Or just tweet. In Lanarkshire, Scotland, from June 25th until August 29th, there's going to be, they call it Jurassic Lanark, where locals and visitors can find 20 dinosaurs and other prehistoric animals. They've got Brachiosaurus, Triceratops, Brontosaurus, Stegosaurus, Allosaurus, T-Rex, Dromaeosaurus, Velociraptor, and Pteranodon. There's always that one, and that's why I say, and other prehistoric animals. Yeah. <laughs> You can follow trail maps or use an app to find them. The animal statues are going to be all around the town center and the World Heritage site there. And if you find them all, you get a badge. Sounds kind of fun. Mm -hmm. Good reason to get out there and stretch your legs. Yeah, I need to get out there and stretch my legs more. Not necessarily to Scotland, but yeah. <laughs> just outside of the house. <laughs> Back in the U.S. in Malta, Montana on June 25th, Herb the Triceratops, which is a cast, will be unveiled at the Great Plains Dinosaur Museum and Field Station. And they're going to have a free wine and dino event that starts at 4 p.m. Mm. The cast was donated by the Witt Museum in San Antonio. And if you're at the event, there's live music. That's cool. More reasons to get out of the house. I apparently need more because we've been inside a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, now we're into the media portion of the dinosaur news. So recently found was an apparently never before seen promotional video where the band Van Halen sings to their 1981 So This Is Love song next to a life-size sauropod. Yeah, like an outdoor sauropod sculpture, basically, right? Yeah. It took place in 1981 at Prehistoric Park, which is near Milan in Italy. So it's not just a sauropod that makes an appearance in the video. There's other animals, like T-Rex. There's also non-dinosaurs. There's a mammoth. Yeah, of course. Mammoth, T-Rex. I think it's just because that's what's at this park. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Van Halen Italia fan club found the clips. And from what I can tell, nobody really knows why they made this video the way they did with the dinosaurs. <laughs> like maybe they thought it was going to be a music video and just never ended up releasing it or something. Uh, yeah, maybe. It's pretty enjoyable to watch. We got some exciting news in Jurassic World Dominion land. There's a five minute extended preview of Jurassic World Dominion that will play before every IMAX screening of F9, which is part of the Fast and the Furious series. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking like the key on a keyboard. I was like, what do you mean before I, before I press F9? No, the, the movie <laughs> F9. And that starts June 25th. Lots of stuff happening on June 25th. So we've got a lot of spoilers here. If you oh, don't no. want to hear about them, I'm going to take off ahead. my headphones and not listen. Well, Gary, you have to hear about it, but other people don't. No, I don't. I'm taking off my headphones. <laughs> okay. And he's covering his ears with his hands. Let's see how this goes. So according to Collider, the preview shows the Cretaceous period, and it looks like a nature documentary where they're following some dinosaurs around. So they've got that aspect of, of it in Jurassic World Dominion. And... During the Cretaceous period, you see 
new dinosaurs that are new to Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. It includes Dreadnoughtus, Oviraptor, Nasutoceratops, Iguanodon, Morus Intrepidus, and Giganotosaurus. Also, Quetzalcoatlus. There's always that one that's not a dinosaur. And these dinosaurs are scientifically accurate, meaning, yes, some of them have feathers. You can see a photo of a feathered dinosaur, which is probably from a scene from the Cretaceous period. So Colin Trevorrow worked with Steve Brusati and Jack Horner, and he said that there's going to be dinosaurs with feathers in the rest of the movie as well. And there will be no hybrid dinosaurs in Dominion. He said it in a Screen Rant interview, quote, This movie is much more of a science thriller than the others. I really wanted to focus on dinosaurs that really existed. The preview also shows the origin story of Rexy. There's a T-Rex and Giganotosaurus fighting. The T-Rex is killed and a mosquito sucks out some blood. And it's the same mosquito that ends up in John Hammond's staff. In present day, then you see the T-Rex run through the forest and people are chasing it via helicopter and trying to tranquilize it. And the T-Rex goes into a drive-in parking lot where people are trying to get away. People talking about this preview who have seen it, they say the VFX is amazing. You can see chipped teeth, you can see webbing in some of the mouths. Colin Trevorrow said that he's always wanted to see dinosaurs in their natural habitat and that this preview was, quote, made to be seen on the biggest screen possible. Of course, Jurassic World Dominion is less than a year away now. It's coming out June 10th, 2022. Garrett, you can remove your hands from your ears. Put your headphones back on. That was a lot of spoilers. I know. Well, it's a whole five-minute preview that people are talking about. Well, I hope people enjoyed that spoiler fest, because I am not a fan. I wasn't planning on seeing F9, but now I might have to, to see this preview. I was thinking about seeing F9, <laughs> and now I don't want to, because I don't want to see all the spoilers. <laughs> this five-minute preview of spoilers, that's... It that, sounds really cool. And if, you know, in, in trailers, they always pack in as much action as possible. So you can probably see like all of the dinosaurs that are in the movie practically. I think I just talked about everything new we're going to see. I don't like it. Well, who knows, though? We won't know until next June. Yeah. And I don't know if I'll be able to avoid the spoilers because now I got an extra year to avoid spoilers during. Mm -hmm. It's going to be tough. Woe is me. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big baby about spoilers. <laughs> okay, I've got another Jurassic World bit of news. Nothing to do with the movie. This is Jurassic World Evolution 2. The game. The game. They've got new biomes, maps, buildings, and new dinosaurs. Well, the game hasn't even come out yet, so hopefully it'll all be new. <laughs> so it takes place after Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, and in the game, you have to capture, contain, and keep your dinosaurs healthy. Sounds familiar. There's going to be over 75 animals. There's dinosaurs like Triceratops and then marine animals like Mosasaurs. Also, the flying ones like Dimorphodons or something that resembles them. Well, that's cool because in the original Jurassic World Evolution, it was all land creatures. Mm -hmm. Didn't have anything swimming or flying. Be curious if Spinosaurus is swimming in this. Oh, yeah. I'm also, I keep thinking because they break out and they like attack the people. And the most difficult part, it seemed like, of Jurassic World was when the pterosaurs broke out and they were like attacking everybody and picking people up. Like it's a lot harder to contain them afterwards. Oh, yeah. Because with the big, di especially like a sauropod breaks out. So you can just mosey over there in your Jeep, tranquilize it, move it back into the pit. Like there's no rush. <laughs> Even the velociraptors, it's like they're quick. But if the people run, they can run almost as fast. When it comes to the flying animals, that's going to be tricky. Hopefully they like, stay contained pretty easy. Otherwise, we're going to need a lot of those bunker shelter things that people can <laughs> run and hide in <laughs> at a moment's notice. They could probably get into those too. Well, they don't have hands. They don't know how to open doors like oh, the raptors. That's, oh, if they work together though. Ugh. So the game will be released at some point this year. We're going to have to play that. Mm -hmm. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Juchung Tyrannus, which was a request from Real McCoy's 9VR Patreon and Discord, so thanks. Juchung Tyrannus was a Tyrannosaurid theropod that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now Shandong province in China. It looked similar to Tyrannosaurus, and it had powerful jaws and small arms with two fingers on its hands. It was found in the Xinga Zhuang Formation, Ju Chung Tyrannus was large and carnivorous. It's estimated to have weighed up to six short tons. The type and only species is Ju Chung Tyrannus magnus, 
It was described in 2011 by David Hone and others, and the genus name means Juchung Tyrant. So the genus name refers to the type locality, Juchung City. And the species name means great in Latin because it's so large. Mm, like, what is it, Magnus Cum Laude? Magna Cum Laude? Same Magnus? I suppose, but usually that has to do with college degrees and distinctions, not size. Well, I was thinking like it was a great, like you were one of the greats of your class. That might be what that means. Magna Cum Laude means with great honor. Oh, okay, cool. So it is the same great. I guess, but since they named it great because of its size, I feel a disconnect. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Dave Holm wrote on his blog, he's not fond of place name Saurus type names. <laughs> and he wrote, quote, some of us are born with bad names for dinosaurs. Some achieve bad dinosaur names. And in this case, some have bad names thrust upon them. So apparently he didn't want to name it Juchung Tyrannus. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> The fossils of Juchung Tyrannus were found in 2009 while a construction crew was digging foundations for a museum. The holotype includes a nearly complete right maxilla, the upper jaw, and left dentary, the lower jaw, and both have teeth. It's interesting. It's got the upper jaw from one side and the lower jaw from the other side. Yeah. It's now housed at the Juchung Dinosaur Museum. Oh, and there's a cast at the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology. The maxilla was damaged during handling, but the cast was made and it was photographed before the accident. So they know what it looks like before the damage. There's no broken bones or signs of pathologies. Juchung Tyrannus was probably an adult or near adult, and that's based on its size and characteristics that are seen only in adult tyrannosaurs, such as heavy sculpting on the maxilla. The maxilla was 25 inches, or 64 centimeters long, and the dentary was about 31 inches, or 78 centimeters long. Two adult T-Rex specimens have maxilla that are 1 and 2 centimeters longer, and Sue the T-Rex has a 79 centimeter long maxilla. Yeah, so a really almost T-Rex size there. Yeah. Also, Tarbosaur specimens range from 19 inches, or 49 centimeters, that one's probably a juvenile size, to 29-ish inches or 73 centimeters long. And a few of them are in the low 20s in inches or 60s in centimeters. So this is bigger than that. Yeah, so it's in between. It is hard to know, though, the exact size of Ju Chung Tyrannus. Yeah, comparing jaws isn't really the, <laughs> the gold standard for size estimates of animals. Yes, but the Dentary of the holotype is a bit smaller than most T-Rex specimens and a bit bigger than most Tarbosaur specimens. And based on maxilla, the holotype is about the same as or in between Tyrannosaurus and Tarbosaurus. So, taking those factors into consideration, Juchung Tyrannus is estimated to be between 33 to 39 feet or 10 to 12 meters long. Juchung Tyrannus had unique features in its skull. There's subtle features in how the fenestrae, fossa, and other parts of the skull are organized. Near the front of the fenestra on the maxilla, so that hole on the snout, there's a rounded notch, and there's a horizontal shelf on the lateral surface of the base of the ascending process of the maxilla. That's that part that's going up from the upper jaw. Hone also said there's probably a lot of Juchung Tyrannus fossils that have been collected, but they're isolated, and so far it's hard to distinguish it from another tyrannosaur that was found in the area. And that tyrannosaur is thought to be different kind of tyrannosaur from Juchung Tyrannus because the teeth are different. So for now, they can only for sure point to the two skull pieces that were found together as belonging to Juchung Tyrannus. A second dentary and a second maxilla was found at the same site in the Zhangjia Zhuang quarry, and that's different from Juchung Tyrannus which means that there's probably at least one other tyrannosaur from the area, though it's not yet named. And that other tyrannosaur, the teeth have serrations that go all the way to the base of the tooth crown. That's what makes it different. Extra serrations? Yep. Now, Hone wrote on his blog around the time of publication, quote, While 2010 was celebrated as the year of ceratopsians for many, it should not be overlooked the huge number of tyrannosaurs that have cropped up in the last year or so. <laughs> Typical tyrannosaur lovers. <laughs> <laughs> Juchung Tyrannus was the second Tyrannosaurine from China that was found, and it probably overlapped with Tarbosaurus. There's no direct evidence, but the fossils were found near each other in terms of time and space. 
A phylogenetic analysis in 2013 found Juchung Tyrannus to be the sister taxon of Tarbosaurus. Both of them are Tyrannosaurines, and suggested that Juchung Tyrannus and other known Tyrannosaurids in Asia were part of an evolutionary radiation. That's a rapid increase in the clade's diversity. And that came from the same North American stem that led to Tyrannosaurus. There seems to be a trend of multiple species of large carnivorous dinosaurs living at the same time and place. They probably fill different ecological niches. Ju Chung Tyrannus was probably a mix of a predator and a scavenger. Like essentially all big carnivores? Yeah. But having so many large carnivores around each other may have been actually more of the norm. The comparison was Spinosaurus in the Chem Chem beds. Stromer's riddle. Mm-hmm. But what's unusual then is that doesn't seem to be the case for Tyrannosaurus rex. In the Hell Creek formation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Unless Dakota Raptor was all over the place or something. But Dakota Raptor was fair, was quite a bit smaller. Yeah, that's true. Juchung Tyrannus fossils were found in what used to be a floodplain. The dinosaurs probably washed together during floods and then fossilized. And it's found in one of the highest concentrations of dinosaur fossils in the world. Other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place include Cynoceratops, Hadrosaurids, probably Shantungosaurus, and Ankylosaurs. Hooray! And our fun fact of the day is that Spinosaurus wasn't the only dinosaur fossil destroyed during World War II. Shock! Gasp! <laughs> there were at least five others. Oh, wow. I had no idea there were so many. So, after Spinosaurus, I think the most lamented loss is probably Carcharodontosaurus. Mm. There was a Carcharodontosaurus partial skull and skeleton, which was also collected by Ernst Stromer, and that was destroyed in, I believe, the same bombing. Carcharodontosaurus was named in 1931 by Stromer, which was 16 years after Spinosaurus aegypticus, although you talked all about how he was in Egypt collecting these fossils and it took a long time to get him back to Germany. Mm -hmm. However, even though Stromer named Carcharodontosaurus, they weren't the first Carcharodontosaurus remains discovered. They just weren't called Carcharodontosaurus yet. De Perret and Savornan described Megalosaurus saharicus in 1925. Oh, Megalosaurus, the wastebasket. <laughs> exactly. And then Stromer erected the genus Carcharodontosaurus after finding a more complete skull. So back when they found it was mostly teeth, basically when they found it in 1925, and then when Stromer found a much better skull, he was like, okay, yeah, this one should definitely get its own genus name. Although Carcharodontosaurus largely does refer to the teeth being sort of shark-like in their sharp serratedness and all that. There's another interesting parallel between Carcharodontosaurus and Spinosaurus in that they were both found in Egypt and thousands of miles away in the Chemchem -chem beds of Morocco, although in the case of Carcharodontosaurus, it was first found in Morocco, and then Stromer found it in Egypt, whereas with Spinosaurus, Stromer first found it in Egypt, and then other people later found it in Morocco. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe there is something to this whole northern end of Africa had a lot of back and forth, even though it was really far apart. Even though Stromer's fossils were destroyed in the bombing, the holotype wasn't. Oh, that's good. So theoretically, we should be able to use the holotype instead of Stromer's skull, which was made a neotype at the time because it was a better fossil. But as Brusati and Serino put it in 2007, quote, the holotypic teeth of Carcharodontosaurus saharicus may have been originally kept in a fossil collection in Algeria or in France, presumably Paris-Lyon, where C. Depare once taught. We were unable, however, to find any record of their existence in collections in either country, as with several other holotypic specimens described in the early 20th century from the Sahara, the teeth are regarded as lost. Oh, no. Yeah, so the original holotype is gone. The best neotype that we had was destroyed in World War II. But then fortunately, in 1996, Serino et al. described another neotype to replace the previously lost neotype. And so now we have a pretty good idea about what Carcharodontosaurus looks like. And some people have talked about how maybe this is why T-Rex is so much more popular than Carcharodontosaurus, because we have all these T-Rex specimens and they've been around and on displays for 100 years, whereas Carcharodontosaurus basically got lost for such a long time. T-Rex was named earlier, too. Yeah, that's true. And it is also more impressive with its bigger teeth and all that and wider head. And Osborne named T-Rex 
with the idea in mind of making it popular. Yep. And it was mounted like 30 years almost before Carcharodontosaurus Mm -hmm. even had a skull discovered. For the other dinosaur fossils, which were destroyed, there's a fun Wikipedia page. Maybe not fun, but useful Wikipedia page about destroyed and lost dinosaur specimens. And there's also a book titled The Lost Dinosaurs of Egypt by William Nothdurft, which apparently got turned into an A&E documentary, which I found on YouTube. So maybe that'll be in an upcoming watch party. Cool. But as far as dinosaurs that were destroyed, there are two more that were named by Ernst Stromer, which were destroyed in that same bombing, I think, in World War II of Munich. So there's Egyptosaurus, which was also found in the Baharia Formation in Egypt, and Bahariasaurus. You can probably guess where that one was found. Mm-hmm. And Bahariasaurus is likely either a Carcharodontosaurid or Tyrannosauroid or Megaraptorin. We don't really know. It wasn't the greatest fossils, and we don't have the best records of it. And again, they were destroyed. So all four of those, the Carcharodontosaurus neotype, all of the Spinosaurus material we had at the time, and all of the Egyptosaurus and Bahariasaurus stuff that we had was destroyed. Bummer. Yeah, it is a big bummer. There was also quite a bit of Kentrosaurus material that was destroyed in that same bombing in Munich. That's from the Tendaguru Formation in Tanzania, and it was named by Hennig in 1915. So some even older stuff. But fortunately, the holotype remains intact in berlin at that museum for naturkund which you were talking about earlier Mm -hmm. this might be one of those which could use some repatriation or something since it comes from tanzania so i think that was all the dinosaurs that were destroyed in that munich bombing there are five of them although kentrosaurus wasn't the holotype and there may be some other bits of these other dinosaurs out there however there was one destroyed in france also in world war ii that's pochilopleuron i think is how you say it which was actually described way back in 1836 by Oud de la Champ, which is quite a loss that we had such an early dinosaur discovery, which was completely obliterated. Yeah. Fortunately, there are a couple casts that were made of it and put on display throughout the world before that. So we have like the Gastralia and a, a couple other bones, I think, but most of it was destroyed. And that was at the Musée de la Faculté de Sciences de Cannes. And it was originally found in the Calcaire de Caen formation in France. That's the only one that was actually found in Europe and destroyed in Europe during World War II. Mm. It's an interesting sort of point to just because you've got a big fancy museum in another country, it doesn't mean exporting it to that country makes it safer. Because if those fossils had stayed in Africa, they may not have been destroyed. Might still be around. Maybe. There's no way to know for sure now. That's true. It's also, uh, I guess this wasn't possible back then, but another reason why it's good to digitize. Yes, or at least make casts like we have for Pochiloploron. And then there's one I could find which was destroyed that wasn't related to World War II, and that's Podokosaurus, which was named by Talbot in 1911 from the Portland Formation in the United States. And that one was destroyed when the Williston Hall at Mount Holyoke burned down. Oh, no. Yeah. Lots of stories of fires destroying things. Yeah. I didn't see anybody talking about dinosaur fossils that were lost at the National Museum of Brazil. It could be still figuring out what exactly was lost. Yeah, that's what I'm... But I'm hoping that they did figure it out and just no dinosaurs actually were lost. Mm. But I might be... That might be wishful thinking. It's probably too soon to tell. There were so many specimens at that museum. I think there's there's two morals to the story. One, make backups. And two, don't bomb museums. (laughs) Or just don't bomb things in general. Yeah. And three, digitize. I guess that falls under making backups. Yeah, that's the best kind of backup. And that wraps up this episode of Vino Dino. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear and want to hear even more of it, like in a bonus content form, then join our Patreon at patreon.com slash Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.